Hello. In this uh, video, we're going to continue in chapter 15, and we're going to be looking at sections 1 and 2, and uh, the lecture tutorial lesson on uh, the Milky Way scales. And uh, to begin with, we're going to start learning about uh, the structure of the universe by looking at radio waves. This is a, a very interesting um, manner of uh, understanding the structure of the of the galaxy, and it is a very um, kind of incredible. Uh, it's hard to imagine that we can get uh, information from the gas around us, and this is the idea behind the whole um, deduction of the structure of the universe by means of the radio waves. Turns out that if we have gas out there in the interstellar space, basically we have hydrogen, and hydrogen is composed of a proton, positive charge, and uh, an electron. Well, it turns out that those uh, two um, particles are somehow spinning on their own axis, and um, they create a, a tiny magnetic field. And um, they tend to align themselves in either parallel or anti-parallel configurations. And this one happens to have higher energy than this other one. So uh, it is preferred by the uh, hydrogen atoms to um, uh, uh, achieve this configuration. And if they are produced somehow in this configuration, then um, in an average time of seven years, they, the, the, the uh, electron will flip and we end up, uh, it will end up with this uh, anti-parallel configuration. The difference in energy between these two different states uh, is released as a piece of light, a photon, that has a wavelength of 21 centimeters that falls in the uh, in, in uh, a radio wave. And these uh, radio waves uh, can then be detected and with that we can get an estimate, an idea of where the gas is and how fast it's going because this can also be Doppler shifted depending on the relative velocity of the hydrogen atom with respect to, to us. And this is how it is done. Uh, here we have a view of uh, a top view of a galaxy that is spinning and it is um, the arms are trailing the way that the galaxy is spinning and we can have gas uh, if we if we take the solar system to be here and if we look in this direction and we point our radio telescope in this direction we can see gas uh, at this point which is on this inner arm the innermost arm or we can see gas here on the next uh, arm or in the third arm or on the fourth arm and of course uh, given that they are at different distances away from uh, the center they're going to be moving at different speeds and um, we will see the relative uh, the so-called differential speeds uh, of, of the arms in the next chapter but um, this difference in the speed is going to give them a different Doppler shift with respect to us. So we're going to be getting the 21 centimeter line from one, almost as a 21 centimeter line, a little shift because it's so, so close, so we're moving practically at the same velocity. But this one is going to be moving as a relatively different velocity, so it's going to be somewhat Doppler shift, and this is more Doppler shift, and this one is even more Doppler shift. So by looking at um, these uh, Doppler shifts from uh, all four different uh, arms, we can get an idea of how they are, uh, how fast they are moving, and this tells us a lot about uh, the structure of uh, of our Milky Way. So these hydrogen clouds are the ones that provide the information. We have um, this video here that I will um, insert in the in this video and in this one which was calculated uh, obtained in, in, in an observatory in France shows how this is done and how the different arms can be identified by looking at the, at the shift of the Doppler in um, the, uh, the 21 centimeters
Well, I'd like to mention something that we did here a few years ago. We have here um, Luis Basurto, that was my master student at the time, and he built a radio telescope. We all know about the large radio telescope, the very large array that is in Socorro, New Mexico, but uh, little is known about the little array that is that was uh, here on the roof of the physics building a num for a number of years. And basically it, was, it consisted of, of two big dishes, the old fashioned dishes that were used for capturing satellite information for your TV shows. And those two were connected by means of couplers and amplifiers throughout. And um, that signal that was being received by the two dishes was passed down through a hole in the ceiling to the one of the labs in the third floor of the physics building. And it was used to compile data. It was uh, the interesting part the, is that these uh, radio telescopes operate uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, we have nothing to do with uh, having light or not having light. It's radio wave, and the radio wave comes uh, uh, from the gas. So um, it cannot be focused, the telescope. But then again, you don't want to focus it because we cannot focus it on a single atom. So we just uh, let the clouds radiate, the uh, hydrogen clouds out there radiate, and we just capture what we see. And it can be used to compose this uh, heat map in which uh, we have high concentration, like a source of radio waves. And, and you're going to see that, um, in, in, well, in the previous video, you saw this type of, uh, of heat map that tells you how the, the uh, what is the distribution of, of gas around the Milky Way. This is uh, one of those such uh, maps. And this one was mapping uh, the whole universe, except for this wedge here that was being obscured by the Earth itself. We cannot uh, look down because of the ground. But um, it is uh, it allows us to, to see, you know, the configuration of, um, of uh, our galaxy in a different way than by looking at uh, bright light. Well, we have um, a different way of uh, observing the universe. So in addition to the radio waves, we can also look at the light coming from very powerful stars like the OB, so-called OB association. Though these two not only produce a, a very strong light that can be seen from far away, but they also produce uh, the, the, the ionization of uh, of hydrogen and forming the, the those uh, regions known as uh, the H2 regions that we see here. So we have um, all those manners of looking at um, of the, the studying the structure of the universe. We have another one here coming from the hydrogen gas, and we can see that this is from uh, we're looking at. Um, a galaxy that from the top down and we can see that is there is a uniform concentration of gas the yellow and the red means higher and those are the arms of course looking at all the information that we have obtained about the galaxy we we now know that there is a, a disk like uh, we mentioned in the introduction there is a the nucleus or, or the mulch and uh, the sun is here about 26,000 light years and we know that this is about 50 and the whole from edge to edge the whole length is a hundred thousand light years and all these things that we see here are a halo of um, globular clusters but it turns out that this is not all um, the motion of some stars that are on the outer edge, and we're going to see this in the next set, chapter, are, are moving uh, way faster than expected. So the only justification that we can think of is that there's got to be something out there. And that leads us to believe that there is a halo of mass, which is invisible to, our, to us, 
and this uh, the, the has been given the name of uh, dark matter. So all of this that we have here, that our own whole galaxy, which is about a hundred thousand light years in, in length, is a tiny part of the whole thing that includes the dark matter. Putting all of this together, we can see what we know, and we uh, these images uh, were taken by the Cosmic Observer uh, Colby Satellite in 1987. Those guys got the Nobel Prize around that time for finding the background radiation. Well, these pictures, in fact, are do not correspond to a picture from the outside, but from the inside, except that the, it was taken this way. Uh, while Kobe was taking, looking around. So this has to be, in fact, turned like this so that we can get an idea of uh, how the structure of the universe is, of the galaxy is. Well, here uh, are the questions that you would have to answer. I recommend that you study them because you might see them in an upcoming quiz. More questions? Now we go to the Milky Way scales, the lecture tutorial on the Milky Way scales. And for this, of course, you're going to have to open your booklet and work on your own and um, or a, with a team better. But um, let me uh, start with this pre-activity question. Imagine that you could travel at the speed of light, starting from Earth. How long would it take you to travel to the center of the Milky Way? Well, that's uh, uh, an interesting question for you. This is uh, the material that we're going to be using in this um, lecture tutorial activity. And basically it is a picture, a uh, top view of a galaxy that tends to represent our galaxy. Of course it is not. It has some uh, points here, it has, it has the sun there, which of course is not the actual sun, but they are just placing, placing a dot there. There's another dot labeled A, another dot labeled B, another dot labeled C, and they are giving us the scale from edge to edge. They are saying that this length is 100,000 light years, from uh, center to edge is half of that, 50,000. And there are some other points labeled here, uh, D there and E here. And you're supposed to use a ruler and to get a scale for this in using your um, booklet. And the ruler is supposed to um, help you determine uh, transformation between this length and 10 centimeters. They are saying that in this picture, one centimeter represents 10,000 light years. So from here to here should be 10 centimeters. And uh, of course, if we divide this by, by 10, the, we're, we're gonna get that one millimeter represents 1,000 light years. One millimeter represents 1,000. Well, um, I have a, a ruler here that I took from my kids. And you can see that it goes from 1 to 11. So basically it is giving you 10 centimeters here. I'm also labeling the sun. And with this, we can start um, answering questions. The sun position in the Milky Way right there. Uh, what is the approximate distance from the sun to the center? Well, you have to take the ruler, measure this distance, and more or less see that it's two and a half centimeters, corresponding to 25,000 light years. Okay, with this in mind, we now look at um, uh, the following. They, we're, um, I label here all the points A, B, C, D, and E, and at the same time, um, the, the, the question number two is giving us five objects in the sky and they are saying that this one is nine light years from us, 26, 260, 810, and 1400. 
So the question is, what letter would represent these objects in, in the sky? Uh, it doesn't have it doesn't have to be a different letter. What we have to do is just look at the distance and say, well, if this is the distance, then it better be B or D or A, etc. So at this point, you should uh, stop, pause the video, think about it before I, uh, I give you the answer. Okay, here, here I go with the answer. Well, given that one millimeter represents 1,000 light years, and one millimeter is the distance between any two adjacent uh, lines on the ruler. So one millimeter is going to be probably less than the distance between the sun and A. And one millimeter is a thousand. So this one is way less than a thousand. This one is also way less than a thousand. All of these are less than a thousand, except for this one, which is a thousand and four hundred. So all of this are going to be represented by A. doesn't mean that they are all of them on top of each other at A, no. It means that they are at a distance that would be uh, equivalent to the distance between the Sun and A. So the answer for all of these are A's. Now you might question, how about um, Deneb? It's, uh, well, in this scale it would be 1 in 1.4 millimeters. 1.4 millimeters. So it has to be A because the distance between C and B, the options given is uh, A, B, and C. Well, B is um, way more than 1.4 millimeters, so it cannot be, and C is even more than that. So it has to be A. Okay, continuing question number three. We usually think of uh, Dana, to be, Dana to be a bright but distant star at this uh, 1400 light years away from the sun. Compared to the size of the Milky Way, is Deneb truly distant? Well, we're saying that if, if uh, it should be about a distance like the point A from us. Comparing this to the size of uh, the Milky Way, of course it's not. So the answer is no. It's only practically on top of uh, the, our Sun. Question number four. Are the stars in question two, these stars here, outside the Milky Way? Well, no, uh, they are just next to us. As a matter of fact, they, they are hardly separated from us. So, all of them are inside of the Milky Way. Continuing, now we see our three objects. We have um, Messier 45, Messier 1, and Messier 71. And um, they are given, uh, we are given the distance that they are from us, from the sun. And this one is 380 light years. This one is 6,300 and 12,700. So again, uh, question number six, are these Messier objects part of the Milky Way? Well, this one is one third of this. So this one is less than one millimeter away from us. So it's practically on top of us on this map. How about this one? Well, this one is six centimeters away from, from us. Dividing by a thousand, we can see that it's six millimeter. Sorry, six millimeters. So less than one centimeter. So it is very close to us. And this one is gonna be 12 millimeters or 1.2 centimeters. So uh, again, very close to us. And all three are gonna be inside of the Milky Way. There's no way that being that far from us, they are going to be outside the Milky Way. So the answer is that they can be represented by A, B, and C. A, this one being less than one millimeter, this one being 6.3 millimeters, and this one being a little bit more than a one than one centimeter. And yes, they are inside of the Milky Way. Next question. Uh, the Crab Nebula is a width of 11 light years. If you wanted to accurately draw the Crab Nebula in the diagram, would you use a small blob or a tiny dot at the location? Well, uh, 11 light years is nothing compared to one millimeter to a thousand light years. So it's gonna be a fraction of one millimeter, which means that it has to be a very small, tiny dot instead of a small blob. Continuing in number eight, the sun is much more than a nebula. We use a dot to represent the sun. 
Um, the question is, is the dot too small, too large, or just the right size to represent the, the sun? Well, it's extremely large because the, the, the dot there is about a millimeter, which means that the dot itself is covering uh, uh, an area that has a diameter of about a thousand light years, which is way, way more than the diameter of the, of the sun. So it's way too large. And now we have uh, three more objects. One is uh, a dwarf galaxy in SAC, and a large ma ma magnetic cloud in the Andromeda galaxy, and they are at these distances from us. Um, in terms of, um, of um, our distances, remember that one millimeter equals a thousand light years. So this is 80 millimeters away from us, which means that it's eight centimeters away from us. So uh, this is the whole thing is 10 centimeters. So eight centimeters in this direction would be inside of um, the galaxy, but eight centimeters in the opposite direction would be uh, uh, outside the galaxy. So we can probably fit it inside, but um, it's, you know, iffy. Uh, the Magellanic cloud, 160 uh, millimeters, which means it's 16 centimeters. 16 centimeters is larger than the whole thing. So it doesn't matter where you are, if you draw something at 16 centimeters from us, it's going to be outside the, um, the galaxy. And Andromeda, of course, is going to be way more than that because uh, if we divide by a thousand, we get 2,500 millimeters or 250 centimeters or 2.5 meters, meters. So it's going to be easily outside. So the question, first question is, do the, any of these galaxies fit on the page? Which one? Well, SAG is uh, the only one. SAG that can be placed in the picture, but the other two are outside. Next question, are the objects, these objects um, outside the Milky Way? Well, SAG that can be inside, the other two are gonna be outside. Um, the closest is SAG deck, but um, Sagdeg would be out of the galaxy. Uh, this is not correctly too. This is eight centimeters. So if we come this way, it's going to be inside. So it, it, it's going to be outside if it, we point in this direction, but uh, it could be inside if we point in this direction. Uh, Sagdeg is approximately 11,000 light years across. And this is this galaxy better represented on this diagram by a small blob or a tiny dot. Well, this one, if we put it in millimeters, it's going to be 11 millimeters, which is 1.1 centimeter. So it would be a, 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 an area like a sphere of this size, the, the circle that I'm drawing here. So it's going to be, a, it, it is better represented by a small blob. Question number 12 within the local group, and we're going to see what the local group is in the next uh, chapter. It's a group of galaxies to which uh, the um, Milky Way belongs. Uh, the two largest galaxies are the Milky Way and Andromeda. And from question 9, we saw the Andromeda was about these many light years from us. On the picture, this spot would be 250 centimeters, two and a half meters, or eight feet away from the, from the dot representing the sun. The nearest group of galaxy to us is the Virgo cluster at 60, 60 million light years away. How many centimeters away would this cluster be on our picture? How many meters away would this be? Well, we have to divide by a thousand and it's gonna be this number of uh, millimeters. If we divide by 10, then it's gonna be 6,000 centimeters. So the question is, 6,000, the, the answer is 6,000 centimeters. How many meters? Well, we divide by 100, it's gonna be 60 centimeters. 60 meters, I mean. It's 60,000 millimeters and, or 60 meters. Well, here are more questions. And these are straight from uh, the lecture tutorial. 
I recommend that you pause the video, read them, try to answer them, and study them for the quiz. That was uh, 15.3. Now, 15.4 tells you a little bit about the nucleus. Now that we know where it is, thanks to the uh, globular clusters, we can um, look at some of the properties. Turns out that if, uh, the, the galactic nucleus is an extremely busy uh, region that has a lot of um, activity and a lot of uh, light. And if, you, if we live near the nucleus of the galaxy, then we would have uh, so many stars nearby that uh, they would be so bright, it would be equivalent to 100 full moons, which is basically uh, daylight, um, uh, daytime light. It would be hard to fall asleep. It would never be dark. But on top of that, uh, there are many OB stars that are uh, producing a lot of harmful uh, radiation, uh, infrared and uh, UV radiation. So here we have um, an, uh, this region here is amplified into all of this, and this region here is amplified into all of this. And this is... Uh, and radios, radio waves, and it tells you how the gas is being distributed. Sag A would be right there, that would be the center. The scale is given here, one light year. And we see that there are many uh, objects there, um, and there, there's more information in the next slide, but here we see that. Um, these, this concentration of stars means that there is something around here that is attracting them. What could it be? Well, if we look at um, the nucleus in radio waves, we can map um, the gas, but not only the gas, but also jets being produced by regions there. And these observations are made with the very large array, which is in, not too far from here, Socorro. Actually, it's not in Socorro, it's like 80 miles from Socorro into the desert. But um, you have to go to Socorro. It's being run by New Mexico Tech. And it allows us to look at the gas. And we're going to see interesting regions, like for instance, look at this arc. Look at those semicircular things. Those are supernova remnants. So we have a supernova remnant here, supernova remnant here, supernova remnant here. And we have radio sources also. SAG radio B2, B1, all those are um, radio sources. We see streaks of light. And those uh, streaks, or like these jets, look at the jets there, coming out from the region. Uh, the only way that this can be formed is by means of um, high concentration, uh, of high magnetic fields that push gas in that direction. So all those threads tells you that uh, on top of having all those all that activity, we also see um, can detect uh, strong magnetic fields. And part of that uh, light that comes out happens to be synchrotron radiation, which is very strong radio emission produced by uh, extremely high speed electrons that are moving near uh, magnetic fields. If we follow the path of some of those objects, we come to some uh, the observation of something very interesting. Uh, for instance, taking um, the snapshots of the position of this uh, star here, this one is S04, we can make a trajectory out of this by fitting this into this uh, ellipsoidal curve. And this is gonna tell us that it is going around that and then coming back here. And if we do this with the, um, the uh, SO19, for instance, then we're going to see that it obeys this uh, path. And it is circling around the same end than this one. 
and then the blue one, and then the pink one, and all of them. So all of this is telling us that right here is something that uh, Kepler's third law is telling us it's extremely massive. By looking at, um, uh, at the, uh, you know, the semi-major axis and uh, periodicity, then we can come to the conclusion that we have something there and that is of the order of 4.3 million solar masses. So these falls into the category of supermassive black hole. And um, it, it is indeed uh, considered to be the center of the, of the galaxy. This uh, video is going to show you um, the so-called dinner of the center of the galaxy. And this uh, has to do with uh, the, uh, the black hole munching and something and producing light that we can see. We can the Diner at the Center of the Galaxy Presented by Science at NASA Deep in the heart of the spiral Milky Way galaxy, a hot vortex of matter swirls around a black hole more than a million times as massive as the Sun. Many galaxies, perhaps all, contain such a monster in the middle. These supermassive black holes sustain themselves by swallowing stars, planets, asteroids, comets, and clouds of gas that wander by the crowded galactic core. NASA's new star spacecraft recently caught the Milky Way's central black hole in the act of having a snack. We got lucky and captured an outburst from the black hole during our first observing campaign, says Fiona Harrison, the mission's principal investigator at the California Institute of Technology. New Star is an orbiting observatory designed to take pictures of violent, high-energy phenomena in the universe. Launched on June 13, 2012, it is the only telescope capable of producing focused images of the highest energy X-rays, produced by the remains of exploded stars and ravenous black holes. It's like putting on a new pair of glasses and seeing aspects of the world around us clearly for the first time, says Harrison. New Star's sharp vision allowed it to pinpoint a burst of hard X-rays coming from the galactic center during an observing campaign in July. Lower energy X-ray observations by NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory and infrared data from the Keck Telescope in Hawaii confirmed the outburst. The Milky Way's black hole had just swallowed something. Black hole snacks are a violent process in which the meal is ripped apart by powerful tides, produced by their extreme gravity and heated to millions of degrees as they slide down the gullet of the gravitational singularity. In this case, New Star picked up X-rays emitted by matter being heated up to about 100 million degrees Celsius. The observation raises the hope that astronomers will be able to help solve a long-standing mystery. Why is the Milky Way's supermassive black hole such a picky eater? Compared to the giant black holes at the centers of other galaxies, the Milky Way's is relatively quiet. More active black holes tend to gobble up matter in prodigious quantities. Ours, on the other hand, is thought only to nibble or not eat at all. Asteroids could be a primary food source. One model holds that trillions of asteroids surround the Milky Way's core. Astronomers using the Chandra X-ray Observatory have indeed detected flares consistent with asteroids 10 kilometers wide, or larger, falling into the black hole. These space rocks would be about the same size as the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs on Earth 65 million years ago. Smaller space rocks might be falling in too, but their flares would be too weak for Chandra to detect. New Star's capability to detect flares above the energy range explored in the past opens a whole new window on this problem and provides astronomers with a powerful new tool for understanding what's happening deep in the core of our galaxy. The monster's menu might soon be revealed. For more focused, high-energy news from the center of the Milky Way and elsewhere, stay tuned to science.nasa.gov. We can also look at um, hot gas. You know, radio waves gives you an idea of, um, of the, uh, the gas. The gas, because of the spin flip of the hydrogen, produces radio waves. But that, it, that happens only when uh, the hydrogen is not excited. 
if the hydrogen is moving inside of a cloud in such a way that it's uh, colliding with other molecules and uh, very rapid velocities, then it, it can produce uh, other types of radiation like X-rays. So we have here um, uh, an image taken by the Chandra X-ray satellite and it shows, this is a density plot, it tells you where you have more gas and or less gas and um, also tell you can fit the um, spectrum to uh, uh, black body radiation and this is telling you that the temperature of the gas is about 100 million degrees so um, there is a lot of gas and the question is uh, where does it come from uh, or is it being produced all the time or is it a, just a transient uh, was was there a massive set of explosions that produce a lot of gas and that's an, that's not going to happen again is it dissipating or if, the, if, if there is a recurrent mechanism that is producing gas continuously etc 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 yet there is a, another very interesting phenomenon taking place it turns out that in some reactions um, some you know particle particle reactions collisions they they can produce um, uh, positrons a positron is uh, on the anti-electron it's a positive electron same mass uh, opposite charge it's in uh, those uh, positrons do not last too long because it is very easy for them to find an electron and once that they collide with one another they vanish into a pair of uh, pieces of light uh, into two photons we have a drawing uh, showing this here you have um, the electron an electron being produced and an anti-electron being produced and these can, uh, this one will find another electron and produce radiation. And um, that radiation is, is uh, known exactly by its energy. We know exactly what energy it should have. So it's very easy to be, to detect that once that you detect a piece of light with that energy, you know that it was produced by, uh, by the annihilation of a proton. And this, of course, tells you that there are of a proton, I mean, of a positron, and this, of, this of course, tells you that um, that positrons are being produced uh, out there. Well, the fact that you can detect the photon doesn't mean that um, uh, the it, it came directly from uh, from where the positron was produced. The positron can be produced and can travel some some distance before being analyzed. So we cannot uh, find the source of the positrons just by capturing the, the photons, but um, we can get an idea of um, when, where, where they are produced, more or less the, the region of the, uh, of the galaxy. Another possibility is to look at X-rays, and the Chandra has observed bursts of uh, X-rays and these come from the gas and it is um, we assume we suppose that what happens is that uh, the um, they are produced whenever mass falls into a black hole and also there is a connection here the bigger the black hole the longer the x-ray burst will last and what we have seen uh, up to now is that uh, the black hole that we have is no more than one astronomical unit across which is consistent with uh, theoretical calculations more questions seven questions I uh, again please study them you might see them in an upcoming quiz and I believe this is the end of uh, section four